Um, welcome everyone to this London Society talk on house into home. Very pertinent um, for today and the time we're living in. Uh, my name's Helen Parton. I'm a design journalist and author, and I'm delighted to um, be in conversation and introducing um, Judith Flanders, who's a uh, social historian and a specialist in 19th century British social history. She's author of more than a dozen books, including A Circle of Sisters, which was shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award, The Victorian House, Domestic Life from Childbirth to Deathbed, shortlisted for the British Book Awards History Book of the Year, and the New York Times bestseller, The Invention of Murder. Her book, The Making of the Home, the 500 year story of how our houses became homes was published in 2014. And Judith has also written a series of crime novels um, with her most recent book being A Place for Everything, The Curious History of Alphabetical Order. So um, on to tonight, um, Judith will be drawing on her knowledge of as author of The Making of the Home and the Victorian City, Everyday Life in Dickens's London, which examines the history of houses and homes and shows how houses turned into homes as work moved from something that you did at home, whether you were a doctor, a lawyer, a shopkeeper or a piece worker into factories and offices. So I think you'll agree that's that's quite a um, timely subject matter to discuss, as I imagine probably most of us have spent um, at least part of the day in the week at home working from home in um, our current circumstances. Um, so Judith, I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. And um, I'm sure you are aware, um, attend attendees, but if you want to pop some questions in the Q&A, um, we will be um, tackling those after do this presentation. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Um, it's true. I mean, we, we've all changed what we've been doing so much in the last year. And I think a lot of us have been thinking about how technology is changing our working patterns and our home life both. And I have kind of thought, well, I've heard that song before. Um, I don't have any more idea than anyone else how the changes are going to play out in the future. Um, as a historian, the future is not my period. But it might be, I thought, that looking at how technology changed home life in the past can give us some clues. And um, spoiler alert, it's not a pretty picture. First, I think I want to defi define one of the main terms, which is home, which we kind of think doesn't need defining, but it sort of does. When I was first working on this subject, two works of literature kept repeating in my head. The first one was Robert Frost's early 20th century poem called The Death of the Hired Man, which has the lines, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And so home is a place, but it's also a more abstract thing. It's a construct of family and emotional obligations and ties. And at first sight, the other work I was thinking of couldn't have been more different. It was written more than two centuries earlier than The Frost. It wasn't a poem, but it was a novel. Um, it's now simply known as Robinson Crusoe. But the full title of Daniel Defoe's book was not merely the name of his main character, but it was one filled with promises of adventure, of exotic locales, of violent death and more. And the full title was The Life and Strange Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe of York Mariner, who lived eight and 20 years all alone on an uninhabited island on the coast of America near the mouth of the Great R River of Orinoco, having been cast on shore by shipwreck, I'm still giving you the title, wherein all men perished but himself with an account of how he was at last strangely delivered by pirates, end of title. The book was a staggering success. It went through more than 37 printings in the first year. And over the following century, it was translated. It was adapted for the, sh the stage. It was rewritten as a children's book. There were sequels. There was even a puppet show. Um, altogether, there were more than 700 retellings of this story in almost every form of entertainment. And 
The novel is more than simply a rollicking tale of shipwreck and pirates, however. It is in literature known as um, basically the first ever novel in English, although there's some discussion about that. It's among the first in any European language. But I think it needs to have a place um, with historians because for me, it is also the first book to treat the details of ordinary domestic life as though they were as thrilling as a disaster at sea or the discovery of a fabled new land. And even in that long title, Crusoe is presented not just as a sailor, he is Robinson Crusoe of York. He's a man with a home, with a place where he belongs. And once he's shipwrecked, long sections of the novel detail the arrangements he makes to provide himself, not merely with food and drink and shelter, but a home. Um, he, he, we get the details of cooking and eating, of sleeping, of how he arranges his storage area. Um, then when he moves house, um, he goes basically out market because he gets one that's big enough that he can sleep and have a sitting area in the same place. And then he says, to enjoy the comforts I had in the world. He builds furniture and is a good householder. Should, of course, he puts up shelves so he can keep his possessions tidy. And after two decades, um, another ship is wrecked on the island and he's thrilled when he goes aboard to find not weapons, he sees muskets, but he doesn't bother to take them. Um, he doesn't bother with the sailing equipment that might help him sail away. But what he's thrilled to find is a kettle, a pot to make chocolate, a fire shovel, which I wanted extremely. This novel, which in the title we're told is one of surprising adventures and is theoretically of a man who for 28 years had no home, is a, is a novel that is filled with ideas of domesticity. Time and time again, Crusoe uses the word home. It's how he refers to his little tent. And over the course of the novel, it appears more than 60 times. It's like a heartbeat, it's like a pulse. And that phrase he uses, to enjoy the comforts I had. Again, for me, this linked up to another century and sadly an all too real story, which was reported in the newspapers in 1867, um, which was the report of an inquest of a man who died of starvation in London. And his widow testified at the inquest and said he had refused to go into the workhouse because he didn't want to give up the comforts of our little home. And in those days, inquests were held in the place where the person died. So the jury looks around this bare, damp cellar. The only piece of furnishing is a heap of rags in one corner. And what comforts of home, they asked. And the widow, it was reported, began to cry and said, we had a quilt. Sorry, that breaks my heart every time. Home, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is a dwelling place, a fixed residence of a family, but it's also the seat of domestic life and interests. It's the place that gives a feeling of belonging, of comfort. It's a place where they have to take you in when you have nowhere else to go. It's a place like Robinson Crusoe's Island, and it's the starving man's cellar filled with things, physical things, that make up a mental idea of comfort and belonging. So for the last few hundred years at least, commodities and home are inextricably intertwined. And home has equally been the place of work for almost everyone throughout history. The Elizabethan poet Edmund Spencer described Irish houses as what he called wretched, nasty cabins, not because they were unsuitable for family life, but because he said they were wholly unfit for the making of merchantable, that means sellable, butter, cheese, or the manufacture of woolen, linen, or leather. For him and his times, 
Houses were good or bad, not according to the well-being of the people who lived in them, but by their suitability for work. The household and the economy were one and the same, with women as well as men being equal partners in keeping the family afloat. In many countries in Northwestern Europe and the US, where husbands ran businesses from home, certain functions were always the responsibility of the wife. They were co-workers. The women fed, they clothed and supervised laborers, for example, or for doctors say they looked after the apprentices or they managed the business's paperwork or they did the books. And they usually contributed an income stream of their own from their own home work. They made cheese, they sold eggs, they kept chickens, they kept animals. Even before full industrialization, a, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> a reshaping of men's and women's roles began to occur at home. Men who had previously worked at home, whether they were craftsmen or tradesmen or laborers or whether they were professionals, began to move out of the house to work in specialist spaces, whether they were factories or workshops or later on offices. And this happened at different time in different places. Agricultural regions were slower to accommodate the change. Those living in and around industrial areas saw it happen sooner. But with the break with older home work patterns came, um, it came fast. Um, in New York City, for example, in 1800, 95% of men worked at home in 1800. By 1820, it was 75%. And by 1840, so just 40 years later, only one in three men still worked professionally from home. And at the same time, these new working practices saw women leaving the house too, to work in factories, workrooms, and shops. But even those who didn't, even those women who stayed at home, who worked at home, were affected. Um, as men left agricultural pursuits, whether they lost their land or whether they moved to the new urban centers for work, women found their work, whether it was keeping chickens or milking and dairying or growing vegetables, vanishing. And even if that work remained, it brought in less or possibly no income. It was now only for the family. Um, and as this was happening, men working outside the house now, say, no longer agricultural laborers, were increasingly being paid in cash rather than um, being fed and given housing. And so their incomes rose as women's declined or disappeared entirely. And cash work became the only work um, that was considered to be work. And it was therefore what men now did. The work that women did, even though it was no less than it had ever been, no longer, because it had no cash payment, it was now redefined mentally. And this mental shift is important when we think about the Victorian notion that is known as separate spheres, which placed men in the public business realm, while the women were supposed to remain at home in the private world of the family. And of course, in reality, separate spheres is an idea to believe that separate spheres had a physical reality, creating borders between home and not home, between public and private, is the same as to say that um, a nation's borders are paint a painted line on the ground. It's an abstract idea. And of course, in the real world, many women worked in the public sphere. Um, working class women worked. They worked in shops, they worked in inns, they worked in many trades, even the ones who had no paid work outside the home. The ostensibly private sphere was still a work site. If they were rich, they had domestic servants, 
they trained, they supervised, and they paid them. They were employers. The very women whose house was ostensibly sheltering them from the world of work is a work site. And in reality, that home was never a non-commercial private space. Um, in the 19th century, far more people trucked in and out of private space it's than 20 or 21st century homes see. Uh, there were more children to begin with, more servants, there were lodgers, there were boarders, and there was this endless procession of people who brought work and services directly into what was supposedly a private non-commercial space. Delivery boys for butchers, bakers, dairies and greengrocers, sellers of household good, menders and repairers, buyers of old clothes and rags, and today what we would call recycling, even entertainers who performed on the street outside. So the house was daily filled with employees and subcontractors, and it was a work site. Um, for those who lived in less urban areas, the pre-industrial rhythms continued into the 18th century in Britain um, and much, much later, sometimes into the 20th century in Germany um, and Northern Europe, as well as a lot of the United States. And today we have long forgotten the sheer labor and time involved in keeping even a small household functioning. It's been estimated that three to four hours daily were spent on food preparation. An hour was spent on um, drawing water every day, an hour on keeping the fire alight, an hour in the kitchen garden, two or three hours milking cows and goats, feeding chickens or looking after other animals, an hour to clean, an hour spent um, spinning, an hour teaching children to read and write or knit and sew, which adds up, I may tell you, to 16 hours a day. Add in the laundry, which took approximately eight hours a week, and by the time the meals were eaten, basically there was no time to do anything except fall into bed in order to get up and do it all the following day. So household work, working at home, for those who lived like this was not about comfort. It was about survival. And for, as I say, into the 20th century in Britain, outside of urban centers, Housework was the work of the household for the maintenance of the household. And a single example um, of this interwoven labor can stand in for much of daily life to see how everyone in the family unit worked in the home. Um, most rural families cooked over an open fire and thus like generations before them, their diet was basically various forms of stew. So to make the stew, the men trapped or shot and butchered the animals. The women and girls plucked the birds and cleaned the fish. They carried water from the streams or the wells, which had been dug by the men, to cook the vegetables, which had been grown by the women, and the grain grown, harvested, threshed, and taken or taken to be milled by the men. The stew was then cooked by the women in a fireplace built by the men, over wood that the men had cut, stacked, and carried into the house that was in turn maintained and cleaned by the women. And the children contributed in various ways. Um, the younger girls would sew, they would gather twigs to make brooms, um, they would knit little um, squares to be used as cleaning rags, the boys would carve um, spoons and wooden trenchers to eat off, and so on and so forth. It was a communal effort. What changed was technology. And it didn't merely change the kind of work, but it changed how it was gendered. And it turned that 
the household into a place of consumption rather than production. So basic foods, bread, jam, butter, cheese, meat, beer, were now routinely purchased rather than produced at home. Frequently the same with clothing, certainly the same with heating. Um, and these novelties were all called labor saving, but whose labor they were saving is almost never mentioned. Earlier, for example, men had spent up to 40% of their working time keeping the house warm and the stoves lit. Um, now, with the new technology of the cast iron stove, the, the kitchen range, it consumed up to 90% less fuel than the open fires had done. So it reduced the cutting, the hauling, and the stacking of wood almost to vanishing point. And then when households, as they did in Britain, mostly switched from wood to coal, the man's contribution to heating became paying the fuel bill. The women's work, by contrast, didn't, mere, didn't only diminish, or it didn't even diminish, it increased. For an open fire, the hearth has to be swept out when the fire is laid. That's it. That's the main oops. Cleaning a range took six and a half hours work a week, basically an hour a day. And as well as that, the ranges brought new possibilities for cooking. When you're cooking over an open fire, you can use one pot. Um, it hangs and that's it. Um, with a range, it's like a modern cooker where you've got the possibility of using many pots. So meals could be more elaborate, which in turn means women spend more time on food preparation, on cooking, and also on cleaning up afterwards. And this pattern repeats over and over with new technology. Um, whether it was cleaning the new bathrooms, women's work, versus cleaning out the old privies, men's work. Shopping for food, women's work, which previously had been grown or harvested or hunted, men's work. Even blessings like running water and stoves that could heat the running water led to bathroom baths becoming more frequent, which means the bathrooms have to be cleaned more often and there's more laundry. And this is all women's work. So by the 19th century, housework is being redefined as tasks confined to the province of women and tasks that are uniquely separated from the cash economy. And when women did work for cash, it's usually described interestingly as supplementing the family income, not contributing, not supporting, despite the fact that at the middle of the 19th century, a quarter of British women um, are at work outside the home, 42% of American women are, and in the 19th century in the Netherlands, for example, half of all Netherlandish women are. Yet what we get in literature and in, in the 20th century in film, um, there's a D.W. Griffith silent movie in 1913 called The Mothering Heart with Lillian Gish. And she is the good wife, these are the captions, whose job it is, we're told, to make the path of the struggling young husband smooth. So he goes out to work and she takes in laundry for cash, but the caption doesn't say she works. It says helping. And at the end of the working day, he comes home, he's exhausted. It's a sign of his manly labor. While Lillian Gish's good wife, she fixes her hair before he comes home and pretends not to be tired at all because her work hasn't been work. And we discover this, we see this in letters and diaries all the way through. There's one woman who spent her days weaving, tending livestock, boarding lodgers, working in the fields, carting wood. And she writes in her diary, I in no way did anything towards earning my living. Sewing, knitting, embroidery had been called work from at least the 16th century. 
it wasn't paid for, but it had a recognizable economic value. Um, by the 19th century, work meant its diametric opposite, according to the dictionary, which defined work when it means sewing or knitting um, as a tranquil pastime. In 1871, the non-work of women became official. The British census gave a sort of token nod, yeah, yeah, nice, nice little ladies, calling housework noble and essential in its introduction. But in the main part of the census, only female labor outside the house for cash was called productive work which implicitly suggests that anything that's inside the house or not for cash is unproductive. And indeed, in 1881, it recategorized housewives as unoccupied. By this time, any work you're doing at home, if you're not being paid and it's not someone else's home, it isn't work. Yet, even as housework is belittled, at the start of the 20th century, um, it was also given many aspects of a profession. I mean, as early as 1861, Mrs. Beaton had referred to the housewife as the commander of an army. She's in charge. But with the appearance of factory work, a new type of manager in the official outside world of work, the efficiency expert, is employed in way is employed to advise on ways to maximize output and therefore profits. And you get now um, female efficiency experts. One of these wrote of what she referred to as my factory which was her house. And in her book, The New Housekeeping, Efficiency Studies in Home Management, she positioned the housewife in the consumer economy, instructing on her on how to purchase mass produced goods efficiently, how to install and utilize the new technology for her household's benefit. So the way she put it is output in a factory is measured in profit. And at home, it's measured by the comfort and the professional advancement of the housewife's family. And so this ambiguity of home and home working um, is quite visible in 19th century magazines and newspapers which frequently use the words family, home, and household in their titles to emphasize that although they were products of commercial enterprise themselves, they were to be consumed as part of the, the private sphere. The British Library catalog lists 95 newspapers published between 1800 and 1900 that incorporate the word home or family in their title. But between 1900 and 2000, there are only 32. Um, I don't think, however, that this means the notion of family and home became less enticing. But what happened was that it migrated outward. No longer is frequently attached to commercial items that were brought into the home. From the 20th century, the words family and home now start to be attached to commercial industries outside the home to, to suggest subliminally to customers that these businesses are their intimate friends. Family restaurants, family holidays, leisure parks that are fun for all the family, hotels that are a home from home, homemade food that you buy in the supermarket, in the 20th century, the commercial utilization of the idea of home merely made explicit what had been an unspoken reality. There might be, as Dorothy and Oz said, no place like home, but most of its component parts could be purchased outside. 
what's going to happen now in the future as we shift again, well, I think we come back in 100 years and we rediscuss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. That was really enjoyable. <laughs> um, I um, was very taken with the idea of um, Mrs. Beaton sort of saying that um, the home was, uh, that the what, her housewives were commanders of an army. Um, what was the reaction to that um, in, in, uh, at the time? Was this sort of quite radical or was it kind of taken um in 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 a certain way how what well was i think it was it was regarded as a metaphor mrs beaton's very interesting because mrs beaton is actually writing for people with not that much money mm -hmm. but what she does is she presents her book as though everybody has a butler and a valet and a housekeeper and a staff of 97 servants um even though the structure of the book really makes clear that she knows perfectly well that the housewife is doing most of the work with the help of probably one servant. So it, it's, it's a very um, interesting take. On, on the one hand, it, it's kind of inclined um, sort of for the snobbish element so that you can think that you're, you know, um, very at least upper middle class mm. but in in reality the structure of the book is there to help the person who isn't remotely prosperous okay um i was i was really interested in the how it all started as as with quite a lot of gender parity i was almost going to say what went wrong but that was kind of what you went on yeah. to explain <laughs> It's heartbreaking, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if I can do it, I, 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 I think I, I'm really good that I got this whole talk done without foaming at the mouth. <laughs> exactly. Oh well, listen, we've got a question already. So, um, um, this is from um, Wendy Charlton, who asks, um, why do you think some cultures don't have a word for home? Uh, she says she's learning Italian. Home translates as casa, which simply means house. Well, casa does mean house. Um, I, I, the, my, my book, The Making of Home, actually has a very, um, the, the core of the book is a discussion of home country, what I call home countries versus house countries. Mm -hmm. um, countries that make the distinction between house and home and languages, countries with languages that don't. And uh, it, it's an enormously complicated subject. Um, one thing I will say in the short term is that casa and in French, where you don't say home either, you say you go um, chez, chez elle, to hers, to mm -hmm. his. Um, both of those words, casa and chez, um, come ultimately from Latin, which is the word for, um, uh, fr from um, chez comes from, like casa from Latin for house. Um, the, the whole of Southern Europe and the Slavic regions do not have words for home. Mm. Um, in Russian, you go domo, you go house words if you go home. Um, and I, I think it's probably too complicated to discuss, but I do see it as a geographic, as a climate related, as the kind of marriage patterns that were practiced in the region's um, difference. Okay. Um, we've got a question um, from uh, Anne Locker who wants to know, um, can you say a little more about the science of household management, not only kitchen design, but the move to domestic science in schools and the professionalization of housework? Well, it's really interesting. The first book, w I, I think, um, which has the idea of a kitchen that is a place that you shouldn't have to hike from end to end to um, get to and from to, to do the various things is Catherine Beecher in um, the States. 
Catherine Beecher was the sister, by the way, of Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. That is totally irrelevant. Uh, it's she, always good to have these facts in there. Um, she you know. taught domestic science. In effect, she didn't call it that, but that's what she taught. And in her book on household management, for the first time, you see um, a kitchen which is designed to have certain things by certain other. Then, as I say, with the early 20th century idea of the home becoming factory efficient. Mm. And then in the 1920s, you get in Germany, the first prop, uh, decent, there, there's an earlier version, but it didn't really work. The first, what we would call a fitted kitchen, um, which is the Frankfurt kitchen, um, which was designed by a, an architect, a, a woman architect in the 1920s. Um, I know, big surprise in Frankfurt. Um, and um, this, uh, the very specifically, uh, she picked up ideas of um, being able to watch her children at the same time, um, not having, and they measured how much an average woman walked back and forth in an undesigned kitchen every year and cut it down by two thirds by this very efficient designed kitchen. So that's the start of it there. Okay. Um, we've got um, a little ad addendum to the, um, to the language question. Um, so um, Alexander Rossetti says that just to mention in Italian, there are other words we refer to like and you're going to have to excuse my pronunciation. Focolare domestico, and it and it mostly depends on the context. Uh, the context, if we refer to bricks and mortar or the centre of our lives. So, well, and, and the interesting thing about that is that that phrase comes from the um, Latin for hearth. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, if you go back far enough in English and Anglo-Saxon, that too, um, the, the um, various forms of government taxation are based on hearth. So this is a very old notion of how you count a home or a household is from the hearth. Interesting. Gosh, I remember having a hearth at home. I grew up in a Tudor farmhouse. So yeah, that was always that was always kind of the center of our of our living room. Um, so uh, Mel Wright's asking, um, my dad was a postman in the 1950s. My mum got a part time job in a local factory and she often said it was for pin money. Yeah, my mum was referred to that phrase as well. Um, what's that? Well, what does that mean? I guess what, what's the derivation or can you give us some context to that? I think that might be quite interesting. Yeah, pin, pin money is a very old phrase and it was absolutely the idea of the woman working for um, her own dressmaking, um, her own sort of toilet table kind of um, ideas. And it, it, it is back to this idea of women never, I mean, apart from anything else until 1880, I'm going to get the year wrong, but it's something like 1883, married women had no money of their own. Um, once um, the, the, the law in Britain was um, a man and woman were, uh, uh, a married couple were one person under law and that person was the husband. Mm -hmm. So women had no possessions of their own. So the idea was that this little contribution, um, which was not legitimately and legally theirs anyway, um, was always a sort of little supplementary add-on. And my own feeling, and this isn't as a historian, this is just a, looking at the 20th century, um, this is a way of women being, that, that, that they should not be equal, that they do not earn, they are not the breadwinner, that this is emasculating, and therefore we call it pin money. I mean, hell, in my first job in the 1980s, um, when I asked for a raise, my boss said, well, you know, I mean, I said, you know, you try and live on whatever the hell it was. And he said, well, how would I know? I mean, you know, your husband could support, you know, I assume your husband has a good job. My goodness, uh, how far so, we've come. You know. <laughs> or how far we haven't in some respects, goodness me. Only a um, few. <laughs> um, so, um, 
Andrew Baharel has got a question. Um, he also says, great, great talk, Judith. Um, in London, the middle classes were persuaded to try living in purpose-built flats from the 1890s, partly because the household was support, supposedly easier and cheaper to run, with typically one living in servant. Do you have any other observations on the transition from living in houses to living in flats? Well, the interesting part is that Britain, apart from um, Scotland, um, Edinburgh and Glasgow are notable exceptions, has really, really resisted the apartment thing. Um, you know, when you go to other European countries, you see from the 19th century, as you say, how um, more and more people lived in flats. And for instance, the, the architect whose name I have, of course, entirely forgotten, um, who invented the Frankfurt kitchen. Um, no, nope, it's gone, sorry. Um, I thought I was gonna be able to come up with it. Um, she worked um, with other architects um, to design uh, housing for social housing. Um, for the working classes, and, and this is very common across Europe, where it happens, and, and it's all apartments, where it happens in Britain, it's always houses. Mm. And we don't really have any concrete idea of why this happened, but Britain has really been very, very, very resistant to apartments and where they have been built, certainly in the 19th century, it was on the whole a sort of um, housing for people who could not afford to house themselves. Yeah, I think that's that's all that. And then that whole idea of um, the British being slightly obsessed with getting mortgages as opposed to sort of renting for the mm -hmm. for the duration of, of a lifetime mm -hmm. sort of, which is, you know, the norm, far more of the norm in, on yeah. the continent. I think probably ties in quite neatly with that, doesn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Um, Melis Howard um, has a question. Um, she says she's really interested in how the ability to work from home relies on getting services from your local neighbourhood. And now during COVID, home, home delivery is so vital. I think we kind of, the Amazon delivery or, you know, whatever other, other kind of deliveries are kind of the highlight of our day almost in this day and age. Um, and it's so vital. Can you tell us more about how homes in history relied on delivery and services coming in through the front door. Well, well this, is, this is the thing. I think that it, it's one of the things of the 20th century um, with, with that um, sort of the, 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 the Betty Friedan wave of feminism, um, where women were isolated in suburbs. They never saw anybody. Um, because by that time you didn't have, I mean, yeah, you'd had the milkman drop stuff on the doorstep and the postman, but that's about it. In the 19th century, um, you had this parade of people going through the house, whether or not you had servants. Um, you had the butcher, the baker, um, all of these people delivered. You had an enormous um, amount of street sellers who would go through suburban streets um, at specific times of day. Um, so first thing in the morning, you would have little watercress seller girls um, who, who would sell watercress that you would eat for breakfast, or you would have boys selling muffins um, in the late afternoon at tea time. And um, you could also, I mean, you, the, the, the pubs would send out pot boys with these sort of wooden cases, um, which had tankards in them um, or jugs and hooked over the edge would be mugs. And you could lean out your window and they would either fill up your own mug or jug or they would fill up one of theirs and you drink it and then hand them the, 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 the mug back and they'd go on. Um, so that there was, the, the, the house was much more connected to the street and it was much more social than we expect today. And what we, we say it's changing in that, yes, groceries are delivered now and, um, you know, you can order anything on Amazon and it'll show up or any other um, online ordering. The difference being is there aren't people involved. Mm. 
I mean, we are still in many ways very isolated in a way that the 19th century housewife never was because, you know, the butcher's boy would come and she would give him her order and then he would go away and come back with the meat. So that, you know, at, at worst, it was somebody to talk to. Whereas yeah. now, you know, you click on the link and, you know, your, your, your supermarket order shows up. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, it, we're sort of fed this idea that technology will save us in terms of um, household, including in, you know, in terms of household management. And again, this is something that um, Alessandra Rossetti um, is making on the chat on the uh, Q&A function as well about, you know, technology has not really helped women in terms of, um, you know, the range of tasks that we have to do. It's kind of sort of compressed everything together and kind of just made not not really made it as easy as perhaps we were initially sold when the when it came into being I suppose. Well, I, I, I think this was the whole point of, of, of describing the, 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 the tech new technology of the 19th century. I mean when sewing machines first arrived they vastly increased the amount of work that women were doing because before women would you know However, I mean, obviously, it, 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 if you didn't have very much money at all, you would buy secondhand clothes in the market, mm -hmm. so you didn't sew. If you had more money, you would buy from it, you would get a dressmaker to, you know, a seamstress mm. would make your dress, or at least you would make the bodice, which was the difficult part, and you would make the skirt. Once sewing machines came, and also um, with the India trade um, expanded um, with cottons, with much lighter fabrics, this increased the amount of laundry. You can't wash wool very well. So basically, it didn't get washed, or didn't get washed often. Once you have the new technology, you have sewing machines, you have running water, you have a boiler in your kitchen range, and suddenly you've got all this housework dump dumped on you. And I think it's very much like we're seeing now where we're working at home and we're sitting there with our screens and the kid is saying, but mommy, I got to go potty. And, you know, we're, we're, we're still, you know, all technology is doing is giving us more to do. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Um, I was interested when you were listing sort of when, um, the sort of gender division of of labor you know men would do this and women would do that and it seemed is was is it was it arbitrary was it kind of anything kind of bathroom associated or kind of outside was men's work or how it seemed an awful work well, seemed first of all an awful lot in favor of, well in the fact that the women got the majority of the tasks but but was there a specific way it was divvied up or was it really just quite arbitrary well i i don't i don't think it was arbitrary i think some of it was strength Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, sort of when, when men were actually sort of um, um, planting their own grain, you know, and, and, and um, plowing, um, you know, that's a matter of strength. But depending on where you lived and the amount of money you had, um, it, it was very much a matter of, you know, who had the time the time. Um, I mean, there were jobs, as I say, you know, butchering meat was considered to be something men did. Um, cooking it was something women did. But it was much less gendered, as I said, that there, there was that woman I quoted who, you know, tanned leather. And, and when um, pre-industrialization, pre when craftsmen worked at home, um, again, it, it was a matter of, for instance, if you were a boot maker, the men would do the heavier stuff, the, the women would, you know, making the soles, the women would do the stitching, and the children would put the little rivets in because they had small hands. Hmm. So it, it's really a matter of a combination of abilities, um, training women did so more. Um, but women did a lot of what was considered men's work and as, as well. Okay. Um, if we can go back to perhaps the beginning, uh, sort of near the beginning of your talk, and you talked about, um, 
almost those idealistic housing days when when the, the work was sort of split reasonably reasonably equally between men and women um what about um the child care in though in those in those days how was that divvied up was that a bit a bit more equal than it sort of was sort of going forward in the decades and the centuries well again we forget so quickly that children started to work very young mm. you know seven eight years old the children are out helping their fathers or at home helping their mothers i mean child Child care is much more limited in terms of, I mean, yes, they had to be taught to read and write, which mostly women did. Girls had to be taught to sew. But then again, you know, the boys were taught to plant or, or farm or so um, that what we think of as child care, it, it just went on for much less time. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and then this idea, I was quite interested in, in um, I was reading about the idea of in the 70s about, you know, the, the, the part of the feminist movement that wanted to be paid for housework and how, I guess, I mean, that's, you know, I guess then that, that seemed quite radical. But actually, you know, that idea of equating housework with cash kind of has been kicking around for, for quite a long time. Do you think it's, I guess that's quite an interesting kind of element of that period of um, women's rights? Well, I, I know that there has been, an, and again, this is not as, as a historian because it's too recent, but mm -hmm. I know that there has been discussion precisely with the census mm -hmm. um, that people, not, not specifically women, although of course it is more women, who work professionally caring for the infirm, the elderly, um are classed as employed women who work unprofessionally caring for the infirm um and so on are classed as unemployed and i know there has been discussion i don't know if it's been done i can't remember what what the end of it as i say it, it's in the last i don't know if it was the last census or the one before there was a discussion about how this army of millions of unpaid carers are being overlooked in governmental terms because they are not being counted statistically. Mm. And I think that is a shift that is changing again. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, members of the audience, if you have any um, other questions, do pop them into um, the Q&A panel. I'll do my best to, to answer all of them. Um, uh, so I was really interested in the in the time you were describing about, you know, when there was 18 hours in the day and that was filled with pretty much, you know, the whole thing of, of getting the water, getting this, getting that, and that kind of evolved. So um, when, you know, when was the, um, can you explore a little more about the idea of but when we shifted to the idea of actually having leisure time, because <laughs> that seems like quite a, a sort of seismic um, shift. I, I, think, I think that's, you know, uh, 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 unless you had a lot of money, um, mm. it's a 20th century concept. Um, mm. You know, the idea that even middle class women with one servant um, would have more, um, you know, prosperous middle class, yes, but that was the indication of prosperity, was right. that you had leisure time. And of course, the way you had leisure time was precisely um, that you had other people to do the work for you. Mm -hmm. um, leisure time is not um in the 19th century leisure time is not a function of having done everything leisure time is a function of paying somebody else to do it mm -hmm. so the idea of the bulk of the population having work having leisure time is really i i would say at least post-war post-world war one Okay, and then we okay. kind of move into the 50s and that golden era of, you know, yeah. how to spend your leisure well, time. And, and again, of having a single breadwinner being, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, 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 in the working classes, the idea of a breadwinner's wage, a family wage from one person is inconceivable in the 19th century. Everyone in the family worked. Um, sometimes the women, as I say, they took in laundry or they um 
kept chickens or did whatever for extra cash. But the idea that a single wage can maintain a family, I mean, the boys are out working when they're 12. Um, the girls go into service at the same age because a single salary didn't maintain a family. And the idea that it would is purely, it's not even 1930s. I really think it's post-war. Okay. It's a, it's a dream until then. Yeah, I mean, it's a dream for many of us now, I guess. When well, exactly. we I mean, it, it didn't last a very long time. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, what we do is we retrospectively push it back as though this is what had always been. Mm. That, you know, in the, in the 19th century, you know, the coal miner went off and earned enough to support his whole family. This is not the case. Yeah, we've got a question um, relating to the very first thing you were talking about, actually, which is, um, do you think that Crusoe's island home was distinctly male? Well, it was entirely male. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there wasn't yeah. a Mrs. Crusoe. Yeah. Not um, al although I, I do believe that there were adaptations where there was a Mrs. Crusoe. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I, I, that's what I find so interesting about this book is that there is no sense in it. I, I think it's very much a, a late 19th, early 20th century idea that caring about your home is female. Mm. Um, I think that in the, um, in the 19th century, um, it, it, in the prosperous middle classes, men were expected to provide the home for the family, provide the goods for the family. So caring about it is, it, you know, it's a sign of your status. So there's no sense that, you know, this is effeminate in any way. I think it's much later on that this happens. And so I think that the Defoe, the 18th century novel, um, this is a very sensible thing for this man to be caring about. Besides, what else has he got to do? <laughs> An interesting take on that. Uh, Melis Howard's got another question, which is, there's a contemporary movement to, in co-housing and co-living housing. And I know that um, Archeo, the practice that Melis is the director of, um, has a particular interest in the area. Um, so that particular housing typology where facilities are shared, can you give some context to the idea of co-housing and shared facilities in history? Like all the best ideas, I don't suppose it's an original one, but one that's probably been um, sort of repeated uh, at various junctures. In well, it, it really, ha I mean, ha one, one of the um, distinctions that I think separates what I call home countries from house countries um, is precisely, I think, the absence of co-living arrangements in um, the Northwest European crescent of home countries. Um, the historical marriage pattern, as far back as we can identify it, has always been um, the nuclear marriage pattern, what, what sociologists with their snappy way of speaking call the Northwest European late marriage pattern, um, which basically means you get married in your 20s and you set up house on your own. Um, so the, the core of the nuclear family. And every time we get, er, we, we discover earlier documentation, as far back as we know, this is the marriage pattern in the living arrangement in Britain. There is virtually no tradition of co-living. Um, I think it is one of the distinctions of home countries versus house countries. Home countries uh, have very, very, very low incidence, incidences of non-family or extended family members living in a household at less than 10% historically. Whereas in um, house countries, it's very high between 30 and 60%. So um, it is ultimately something I know very little about because it does not happen and did not happen. Hmm. Okay, so there, there is something original there. So we'll wait to see about that typology in the future. Maybe you'll be rewriting a book about that in uh, in years to come, perhaps. <laughs> so I had a question um, 
at the very near the start of your talk, you talked about um, the uh, the starving man's cellar and and how he sort of knew that it was it was a home or how it was known that it was a home. And that was because it, it had a quilt in it. Um, can I Isn't ask? Is that a terrible story? It's a it is a terrible story. Now, can I ask you what what signifier in your apartment house um, makes it a home? For you, there's a particular item. A quilt, a quilt isn't a bad thing. I think yeah. a quilt, I, I think most people would understand the attraction of the quilt. Mm. Um, I, I think you know. I, I think that this idea of an object, you know, sort of totemic object. I mean, obviously, everybody has a different one. Um, but I must say that story breaks me every time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there any any items that you can see at the moment, or do you, are you what you're working from inside your inside your flat? I presume. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is there anything there that sort of sparks you, uh, sort of sparks some inspirations to that? Or you, or no, not that I would like to discuss at my inquest now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Okay, well, listen, that is um, I just, uh, yeah, that that seems like a, a fitting kind of time to um, to see if there are any more questions, which I think we probably, I think I've asked all of the ones that are, that are there. So um, I think we're pretty much on time, which is pretty good going, I think, for a Thursday evening. So thank you very much for that. I find that absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure um, there's, there's multiple thanks on the, on the, on the, uh, Q and A as well. So, on behalf of all the um, attendees, I'd like to say thank you very much for that amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>